Hi, I'm Elsie Wellings, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the winner is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I hope you had a great week. I certainly have. Uh, And you've been busy at the Physical Performance Show weekly physical challenges. I've been uh, hard at work undertaking Genevieve Lacar's episode 30's physical challenge of 20 continuous pull-ups and uh, seem to have that one under wraps now. Uh, I've also been working at Ryan Gregson, uh, Ryan episode 31, Ryan's challenge of uh, his uh, activation band routine, which I've been enjoying. And uh, there's going to be another physical challenge laid down by today's guest. So today's guest is a runner who, just like Ryan Gregson, previous episode, and Genevieve Lacars, the previous episode to Ryan, ran in the Rio Olympic Games. And this athlete is quite remarkable. She's a mum of a beautiful little girl, uh, a wife, and an athlete that's had an incredible career, and we haven't yet seen the pinnacle of it. This is Eloise Wellings. Eloise has been a dual Olympian at the London 2012 and Rio Olympic 2016 Games. She's also been a three times Australian Commonwealth Games representative representing our country at Melbourne, uh, Delhi and Glasgow Commonwealth Games. And this year in Rio, Eloise went on to run a PB in the final of the 10,000 metres, taking a staggering 40 seconds off a PB and to also run an incredible uh, final in the 5,000 metres. So to make dual finals, what a remarkable achievement. And many of you listeners would have seen Eloise uh, on the track in Rio uh, celebrating with our previous podcast guest, Genevieve Lacars, uh, after their 5,000 metre final. It was a real remarkable uh, milestone for Australian athletics and Australian sport in general. Of note was the fact that Genevieve Lacar's uh, episode 30 noted that Eloise is the runner who she most admired. In fact, it was the athlete that she most admired. So you're going to hear a little bit about that today, the connection that Eloise and Genevieve have. What to me makes Eloise so remarkable is that she has persevered through a track record of injuries that would have otherwise taken many people off course. 11 stress fractures over 10 years, as you'll hear. And what she's been able to do in in terms of her career is truly significant. You'll hear a little bit about Eloise's heart for her, her foundation, Love Mercy Foundation, and the origins and the story that lie behind that. So guys, this is a real treat. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did in bringing it to you. Let's jump straight in with Eloise Wellins. So, Eloise, Elsie Wellings, what's one thing that scares you? <laughs> one thing that scares me, probably the idea of not getting the most out of myself, not not actually seeing how far I could go. I guess that's probably why I've, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, how did you get through all of your injuries and 11 stress structures in 10 years? And um, I think, like, the one of the biggest reasons I guess is that you know I just I've always had this real desire just to see how far I can go and um you know what what I'm actually capable of and what my limits are and you know I think yeah what scares me most is that I would never find that but you know um it's a journey isn't it so hopefully I'm well on my way to yeah to getting there come on and uh and I mean it's probably a good opportunity to 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 launch in obviously Elsie you know 
this was a very successful Rio Olympic campaign in the 5,000 and 10,000 metres. And, and then there was London, which was your debut Olympics off the back of three previous campaigns. So when you mention not getting the best out of yourself, I imagine through that journey, Elsie, over the years, there's been times where you feared that you wouldn't get the best out of yourself. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, absolutely. Like I was, I, I was pretty disappointed with how I performed in London. Um, but, it, like, looking back, it kind of – it almost had to be that way. Like, it had just been such a, a huge um, build-up and journey. You know, it had been 12 years since I first qualified for the Olympics and I hadn't yet lined up for it. <laughs> and so to actually finally be standing on the starting line was such an emotional moment. And I think um, that – emotion kind of got to me and it was it's obviously quite draining to be um yes yeah, so emotional like that and I don't think that I quite got the best out of myself um in London but you know I think that yeah as I said that that kind of had to happen and I had to go through that process but Rio I always said from the very beginning right from when I got selected that it would be a much more um, it would be much more business-like and it would be like any other race, even though it's not. <laughs> um, but it would be, you know, I'd be I'd be taking measured risks to make sure that I, yeah, I absolutely got the best out of myself. And I feel like I, I did that and that was, um, you know, it just made the experience so much better <laughs> because obviously, you know, you can, yeah, you can put, your heart and soul into something and still not quite get what you wanted and you know especially in this sport but that's kind of what makes it so beautiful and heartbreaking at the same time but yeah to 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 be actually able to perform and um how I wanted to in Rio probably above and beyond how I expected um was amazing and yeah so grateful for that well well Elsie as a fellow runner and um someone that's followed your career from a distance for years I was uh with a couple of running friends on the Gold Coast we were texting each other about you know the finals as they were being broadcast you know on the the mornings of, that they were being run here in Australia and um I think everyone in the running community that knows of your challenges over the years uh, was just so pleased for you. And, I mean, you said it maybe exceeded expectations, if I'm correct. You ran a 40-second PB in the 10,000 meters. <laughs> <laughs> That's a yeah. good day, right? Yeah, it was a good day. Um, you know, I knew that I was fit. I knew, like, we've never trained so hard in the lead-up the last two months, the, the last – month especially in Laguna and you know preparing in the heat and the altitude and the terrain and the hills and just everything about that camp was hard but it was awesome because none of us or like all of us were healthy we were all in a really good um place mentally um and emotionally I just feel like we were we were ready and you know as a team Melbourne Track Club and um, you know, having my family there as well, Indy and Johnny in the build-up was, you know, um, a massive blessing. And just having them come on that journey and see um, and be a part of, you know, the whole experience, like the whole build-up and everything was really special. And then, yeah, and then <laughs> being able to kind of put it all together when it counted was, um, yeah, it was really special. And Elsie, I really love the posts that you put up after the uh, 10,000 metre final of a picture of uh, you know you you running at the stadium there, I think it was at the finish. But uh, the, the caption was what grabbed my attention. You you commented that it was a, you knew it was going to be a good day. Kathy Freeman had given you a hug <laughs> on the warm up track and yeah, uh, yeah. What, what was the story there? Uh, it just I don't know. It was just something. I was just kind of reflecting on <laughs> on the day. I just think. Um, I think I captioned that, you know, normally like I get, I'm, I'm a, a really awkward hugger. Like I, <laughs> if I, if I admire someone, I was like, you know, when you go in to kind of hug someone and they're going in for a kiss and you're just going in for a hug or vice versa. And, you know, you just, you're willing someone to just take control of the situation. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but it was like a clean hug, you know. It was like a really nice. It was, you a, it it. was a good it was embrace. Yeah, and yeah, it was Chris, <laughs> and kind of like a high five. You know, yeah. a high five can go horribly wrong. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, it was good. And I just knew it was going to be a good day. But I actually, I, I said in that caption as well, like I woke up feeling mm. just as soon as I peeled my eyes back, I, I just, I just felt this peace and I thought I'm ready. You know, I just, I actually could not wait to get out there. And I couldn't wait even in the race. I couldn't wait to run the last five laps. I was kind of like, wow. you know, Nick and Johnny described me, you know, as an, like an animal in a cage. Like I was just ready to go. And, um, yeah, I was excited about the, I was excited that, you know, I was the first final um, for the, you know, for the track events. And, you know, for me, um, going out there and kind of leading that and being able to um, hopefully put something together to inspire the rest of my teammates, especially the ones that I'd been training through, uh, training with and, um, you know, done the whole build up with and just going to put something out there to go, hey, like, you can do this too, you know, you can like run out of your skin as well or perform out of your skin. And I was just, yeah, I was excited about that opportunity as well. Well, it's, it's an interesting insight. And is that in comparison, Elsie, to other, you know, major internationals where, uh, you know, on mornings or, you know, the morning of the event, you, you haven't felt a, that degree of peace and excitement? Was it just a special, special Yeah, I think it was just, a, yeah, yeah, because normally, you know, you wake up and you just, you, there's this, you know, there's been times where I've woken up in the morning of the race and just thought, oh, I just, you know, there's a lot of self-doubt and, um, you know, anxiety and, you know, the pressure of the situation, like it's the Olympics, you know, yeah. like you would expect, you would expect to feel all of those things. Um, and that, that is actually quite normal. And hopefully by the time you get to the start line, you know, that hasn't affected you too much, but I can honestly say from, you know, from from the moment I woke up, like I didn't, I just didn't have any of that, which is different. And, you know, I knew that there were people um, praying for me at home and praying for that piece that kind of, that doesn't make sense. Mm. Um, and yeah, I can, yeah, I can definitely say that that was, that was there. That was one of those days. So yeah. beautiful. And, uh, and Elsie actually, while we're on Rio, caught up only last week while they're on the Gold Coast with training buddies of yours and I believe your roommate from uh, Rio, Genevieve and uh, Lacaz yeah. and, and Ryan Gregson. And uh, and Genevieve mentioned something that in the 5,000 metre fighter, which was a very special moment for Australian track and field, having yourself and uh, <laughs> Genevieve and I think it was Maddie Hills, is that correct, in the 5,000 metres? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So the three girls running in the uniforms, which is outstanding. And Gene uh, Genevieve mentioned that, you know, um, she grew up as a girl admiring you and actually listed you as her uh, most admired athlete, which I thought was really, really something. <laughs> and that you said something really special to her uh, that lifted her as, as you were coming into that close of that 5,000 metres. Can you remember that moment? Yeah, I can. I, um, I've i actually been mean to blog about it or write about it or something because I just, you know, I need to get those thoughts down. But um, we were in the – we're obviously in the same heat for the 5,000 metres and we're in heat two and we knew that we had – we knew around about what time we had to do to get through on time and we had quite a few kickers in our race. So we had to make sure that it was an honest pace um, – and we were coming around, um, we were on pace um, at about eight laps. Um, and then two laps later, or well, one and a half laps later, I noticed that the pace had slowed quite considerably. But I was on the rail and I couldn't get out. And uh, I was middle of the pack and I kind of started to get um, a bit panicky. I was thinking, you know, all the biggest kickers are still here. And, you know, also we're, we're not really on pace anymore to get through on time. And, um, yeah, as I'm running along, I take a few more steps and just as I'm in the corner of my eye, I see this blonde <laughs> ponytail and I just thought, oh, it's Jen, it's Jenny. And I just said to her, we need to clear out. And she said, yep. And I said, we need 270s. And she said, okay. And so she took off on the outside, which allowed me to get out. And I followed her and she went, she just went straight past Vivian Chariot 
you know, all the Africans straight to the front and um, did that did that next lap in like 69. And I think the, the following lap was hers was either 69 or 70. And obviously we both made it through on time. And um, I passed the going down the back straight and I just said come on as you know as I went past and and yeah she just got on the back of me and we both you know we finished pretty close together and I think you know we obviously we both just we trusted each other we'd, we'd done so much training in the lead up um you know in Laguna and there was this real trust there and I don't think you know there's not many other people and we hadn't planned that we hadn't planned to say anything we hadn't planned to help each other or whatever we were excited that we're in the same heat because you know it's familiarity and you know if there was a point you know in the race that maybe we could help each other that you know then that would work out but we had no idea that it would be that much because I couldn't get out and she she said after the race that she was kind of in this place mentally where she was just hanging on. Yeah. And as soon as I said, like, Gate almost commissioned her. Yep. So this is what we need to do. She was like, yep. And she just took it on. And, like, yeah, I just think... It was awesome. <laughs> well, that's uh, it's interesting because Jen described it as you know she was at that that point of you know just gosh this is you know obviously that that, that real hurt point and uh, you know we're talking about the fact that often others can see more for us than we can ever see for ourselves and she really sort of used as an example of um, Jen did of uh, you know that was one of those moments where you commissioned yeah. her as you say and off she went and uh, you both both got through and I believe in yeah. the five thousand meter final you were. Relatively close to your PB, were you, or were you? Or was uh, that your PB? I ran fifteen oh one, I think. So and my PB is fourteen fifty four. So I was a little way off, but um, yeah. I, I mean, I was in. I, th- I believe that I was in PB shape. It just kind of didn't. The race didn't kind of pan out as quick as I wanted to. And if you know, if I wanted to do a PB, I probably should have just run quicker myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I. I was still really happy with how the final went as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's to run a, a PB at the Olympics is is pretty difficult, especially in a final when there's you know when it the ta- you know there's a lot of tactics involved involved as well. But hopefully next year I'll be able to get um, get down to those 1450s and even 1440s as well. I believe that I'm still capable of running that quick and. Um, yeah, but 1501 was, I think it's the fastest of, yeah, it was the fastest that I've ran in, in 10 years. So that was exciting. Come on. That's great. That's terrific. Yeah. And, and I mean, mind you, that's after your, your PB in the 10,000 meters, just a few days before. So, yeah. um, you know, outstanding. So would, would you rate that meters your most successful in your career to date? Uh, Elsie, which started I think back so, when you yeah. Were, yeah. Yeah, um, I think so. Like just, you know, the whole you know, all three races, like I, I just can't pick them apart. You know, there's the 10 K as I said, and just everything around that. And, um, the feeling I had going in and just being so ready and obviously running so well and doing a PB was amazing. And then, um, you know, and, and being in position number one on the line, you know, just leading, leading, um, the rest of the girls out on the track, that was really special. And, um, and then obviously what happened in the heat with Genevieve, you know, we'll never forget that as long as we live and when we're old and grey, you know, like that, that kind of will, that, that bond and that in our friendship will, will never go. And, and then in the final, obviously it was just, you know, to run a, a, a final at night at the Olympics with 90,000 people in the crowd, same night as Bolt was running as well. So there's a lot of people there and so much energy and, you know, um, Nick, the things that Nick was saying before the race, you know, you just die with your boots on, you know. I love that. Like, you just coach, go out Nick. and just pour it out, yeah. Yeah, wow. And it's interesting, uh, on a previous interview with uh, Benita Willis, Benita shared some uh, very practical coaching tips as well around that that she'd had, you know, those metaphors yeah. of hang on to the monkey bars until you can't hang on any longer. Just hang up there, you know. It's uh, yeah. So do you find – what was going through your head, Elsie, on the, the start line of, you know, particularly your first final in Rio, 10,000 metres? And for listeners, to give them some perspective, Elsie, um, you know, this, this is a story of a girl that I believe you grew up fairly – 
you know, early in your teenage years dreaming about a, Olympic success, didn't you? Yeah, like I, I it started when I was about 10 years old. I was watching the Barcelona Olympics on TV and I was actually watching Sonia Sullivan, um, Nick's wife, um, go around in the 3,000 metres at the Barcelona Olympics and I was just so inspired by by her and um yeah by watching the whole olympic games and yeah i remember saying to my mum and dad like i want to i want to do that one day so yeah from 10 years old i guess it's it, the olympic dream kind of was planted i guess and uh so here you are fast forward and you're, you're on the start line of your second olympic campaign and in this on this great day where you just knew it was you know it was it was a good day for you and what was going through your head at, in position one there on the start line do you remember yeah, I just I just kept going over all the things that um, you know we'd been practicing in training, especially in like in the final few weeks, just to try and conserve as much energy in the first ten laps as possible, no matter how fast I'm running. So even if we're running three minute k's, you know I'm still relaxed. There's no strain, you know I'm relaxed, and then. Um, yeah, and to stay compact. Just all these kind of words that we'd come up with that would help me relax and remember um, technically what my body is doing. Um, and that distracts me from becoming too emotional and overwhelmed um, by and overawed by the whole experience or, you know, the circumstance or the situation. Like, it's the Olympic, it's the Olympic starting line, so it can obviously become... You know, you can kind of look around and go, whoa, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of people watching, there's expectation, um, you know, what are other people going to think? And I think this is with anything, like any any race or anything that, you you know, you're kind of shooting for when people know your goals or when people, you know, expect you to do something, um, you know, with that comes pressure and I guess your own expectations of yourself and, um, you know, that builds, that can build, you know, has a potential to build anxiety and that can be negative, obviously. So just, you know, in that pressurized moment, just going through the technical stuff actually, yeah, helps me stay distracted from <laughs> the actual uh magnitude of the yeah, event yeah the, the magnitude and the enormity of the event yeah, yeah. And, and any practical words you mentioned words and phrases are there any that you're happy to share Elsie that you know have as yeah, a bit of a mantra think, for yourself yeah I think compact was one mm. one um big word that we kind of came up with that was I guess meaningful for me um you know, especially towards the end of the race, no, like, so no straining, no overstriding, staying compact. Yeah, just going through my body, to like, head to toe, just, okay, you know, especially, obviously, when the race starts, um, you know, what what's my body doing? You know, how can I conserve as much energy here and, but still run as fast as I can? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if well, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, <clears throat> both Ryan and, Jen shared similar things, you know, about staying relaxed and just little words and mantras, and they can be so powerful, can't they? You know, yeah, totally. in those pressure environments where the, you know, uh, the event itself is is so big, such a big yeah. scale. Um, so moving off from the Olympics, there, uh, Elsie, um, and just changing gears slightly to to training. Can I give you a performance round of questions? So these are sort of short fire questions with the first answer that pops to your head are you ready for it uh-huh it's like yes a, it's like an interval session here we okay. go <laughs> <A bit> nervous <laughs> be nervous <laughs> favorite training oh sorry your most disliked training session elsie uh wednesday medium run which i just completed <laughs> it's a wednesday medium long run because it's always obviously the day after our hardest session of the week tuesday and then i do um, gym in the evening, which always smashes me. And then Wednesday morning, I run about 10 miles. Um, and it's, it's an easy run, but I always feel like pretty rubbish. The previous, the gym session on the Tuesday night, how long are you in the gym for? Uh, last night was a long one. It was about an hour 20. Cause we're just, I was going through with my gym coach, um, how we're going to kind of, uh, strategize the next 12 months around world championships and, well, cross country and um so we're just looking at 
my weaknesses right now and how we're going to yeah go through all the phases for my strength and conditioning so yeah it, not but normally a, a typical gym session would take about an hour yeah okay and, and i'm taking a time out on the performance around here because i just wanted to see if, if uh it's something that from your own training and getting the best out of your physical performance has played a big part has has strength and conditioning made a big difference to what was you know your previous track record and previous because you know let's believe that won't ever be part of your journey but uh your previous track record there with the stress injuries that you had was that something that you've added that wasn't there before or you've changed yeah up that's made for a big sure difference? Definitely. Like I started working with um, my strength coach, Jock Campbell. Um, he's a you know local coach and he's been amazing in just um, seeing little weaknesses, you know, in, um, in muscularly and then us being able to kind of work on those. And, you know, the more, the stronger your muscles are, the more they're going to be able to protect your bones when you hit the ground and, Obviously, because running such a high impact sport, um, the stronger you can um, get your muscles, and they don't have to be—you don't have to have huge muscles because you know you want to be as light and as lean as you can, but you want to have strong muscle. And um, Jock's just an absolute magician in um, coming up with a program that helps me, um, you know, stay injury free and also um, have you know good power. I feel like my power is good is good as good as it's ever been um you know because I can run uh, you know I I believe my range is you know better than it's ever been in terms of being able to run a fast 1500 or 3k and then also being able to run well over half marathon as well and I really feel like that the yeah the definitely the the stuff in the gym with jock has um been paramount to yeah those performances yeah and it's such a you know from a physiotherapy perspective working with a lot of runners it's it's something that i'm so passionate about in, as an injury minimization strategy but then also as a performance enhancer too and you mm-hmm. know, for the weekend warriors it doesn't need to be hours and hours it can be quite short and sharp but still have such totally. profound effects so that's great elsie um back yep. on the performance round uh rep yep. two most loved training session um track tuesday any examples <laughs> uh i like 800s we do eight 800s with a minute rest uh eight one k's with a minute rest i also like um but yeah probably probably eight eights the two fat ladies i love it <laughs> <laughs> uh favorite pre-race meal elsie um a uh, great pizza recently before the half marathon melbourne half marathon but i wouldn't normally eat pizza before a race normally pasta like a jamie's italian type pasta yep yep Yep. nice nice so what did you have before your rio finals um i had yeah i had pasta and i think i was a bit paranoid about not eating enough carbs so i was like just carb loading (laughs) um (laughs) Yeah, Ryan was teasing me. He's like, you, you, you're really going for it. And I'm like, yeah, like, <laughs> what, are you meant to, what are you meant to do? But, yeah, I think, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I was really well fueled. So I think I was just going for pretty much everything, every carb, rice, pasta and bread. But I definitely remember having a, a large bowl of pasta. Yeah, cool. Just on the intro, out of interest, sideline again, uh, have you had much discovery you've done through your running career, Elsie, with regards to your best fuel source? Have you got it down to a fine T now after these years? Um, oh, you know, I'm always learning. I think that there's different stages of the year where, we're more relaxed nutritionally than others. Like obviously before Rio, you know, you want to be as lean as possible, but still have, you know, enough strength and energy to get through training and obviously um, get the most out of the race. Um, But yeah, on the other side, on the other side, you have to be, you want to be as lean as possible so that you're not carrying the weight around. Um, But yeah, there's probably one or two races a year that I'll be, that I make sure that, you know, I'm like pretty, you know, at race weight, I guess, Mm. call it greyhound weight for. And then the other races, I might be two, even three kilos heavier, um, just as a bit of a buffer for getting sick or injured. And, you know, I, 
I don't think that you can maintain that sort of intensity for a long period of time. So it's really important to kind of recognise that, okay, after this event, as good as you feel when you're running and as amazing as you feel because you're so light um, when, you know, during that period, um, it's important to kind of, um, yeah, put on that, those extra couple of kilos that you've lost and, um, you know, just train a little bit heavier and even do, you know, the, the, um, willy nilly races, I guess, a little bit heavier and be okay with that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, Elsie? Yeah. Uh, and I know it's, it's, and we, you know, I just think this is just worth us, you know, digging in on a little bit, uh, you know, it's public knowledge, obviously through your earlier days, you know, you struggled with, you know, some eating disorders there. And I mean, I yep. find Elsie helping up and coming athletes in my context as a physio, particularly often, uh, female athletes, young runners, it's such a, they recognize that duality of needing, as you say, to be on certain occasions, the race weight, the greyhound weight, as you called it, um, yep. and then juggling and making peace with the fact that there will be this up and down nature to get yeah. to have a healthy body um, over the course of a, of a year. Is there anything that you would say, Elsie, as someone that's lived through the, the challenges and come out on the other side, just to encourage anyone that might be listening, you know, that sort of going through a journey, an up and coming athlete in that regard? Yeah, I think, you know, just connecting yourself with, you know, people that are, that are wise around it and, um, and being accountable to people because that's really important. Like, um, it's also important to uh, try and stay unemotional about your weight because it really is just a number and, um, yeah, the more emotional you are about it and the more you go by feel, um, I, I feel like that's, that's when you can kind of, um, go downhill with it. But if you actually make it scientific and, you know, I know that my strength coach, coach jock, he's going to take my skin folds at certain times of the year and he's going to, I'm going to jump on the scales, but I don't weigh myself every day. I don't weigh myself every month. I let jock do that it's he he takes care of the science behind it and um yeah I, I feel like making it a bit more scientific rather than emotional and going oh you know you know my running shorts are tighter or looser or whatever or kind of you know critiquing yourself in front of the mirror um but it is you know eating disorders unfortunately it is rife through distance running especially in female athletes and more and more I've seen it through male athletes and if you asked any of the elite um female athletes senior athletes um they most of them would say that at some point in their career it's been an issue and I think just kind of calling it out for what it is and talking about it and being open and um you know I know that there's um, you know, I shared with a, a bunch of, of girls um, the other week, um, you know, up and coming sports athletes and that I know what my triggers are and I know that, that like there's, it's still um, definitely something that I could potentially struggle with mm. if I didn't use the tools that I've learned over the years, mental tools, um, to overcome it and to, you know, to call things out and to either talk about it with someone close to you or to, um, you know, journal about it or come up with those one-liners, those rebuttal things that, you know, you've remembered that are healthy, that, that, that do encourage yourself and do um, the words that you use that do promote nourishment and encouragement and, you know, uplifting words that you can say to yourself you know your internal monologue yep. I think that that's so important for anyone not just female athletes struggling with this but yeah especially important for that like that internal changing for me it was about in changing changing the internal monologue and speaking encouragement and life yeah. words and nourishment and then that in turn that then I was able to change my behavior and my behavior with food and my relationship to food 
Well, LZ, thanks for sharing so transparently, and uh, it's uh, I just commend you because anything that gets hidden never really uh, goes goes well, does it? And uh, as you say, you know, if, if athletes, if you're listening there and you know it's an area, then um, reach out to someone you can trust and start a conversation. Just having that accountability, and you know, so LZ, thank you. Uh, on another Pleasure. sort of uh, such a key. Uh, attribute of performance sleep what's your bedtime have you got a bedtime morning time routine? <laughs> um not really i i tend to i'm a morning person so <clears throat> i don't mind um getting up pretty early for training like um you know but it, it varies like yesterday we did a track session at 9 30 a.m and then last week i did you know a 10 mile run at 4:45 a.m. because I had a busy day, so yeah. like it, it just varies um, depending on what I've, I've got on that day with Andy and um, you know my other commitments with Love Mercy and speaking and stuff. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, ideally I'd go to bed at around 10, 10:30 and wake up at seven ish. So you get a good solid a few hours and obviously yeah. juggling around, you know, uh, hubby, uh, Johnny and also India and family life. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of particularly female runners, mums that would look on and, you know, just be inspired by the fact that you've, you've juggled and you juggle things so well. Uh, yeah. From the outside <laughs> looking still, in. Yeah. Yeah. From the outside looking in. I mean, we're, we, it's a day to day thing for us and sometimes it works out and then other times it doesn't. But, you know, like we're still navigating that. And we're, I'm, I like to look at, you know, athletes like Joe Pavey, who's got two kids and, you know, and even, you know, Karen McCann, she, you know, she had three and how she juggled that. I was, you know, so inspired by those sort of women. And, um, yeah, but we just do our best. And as I said, sometimes we nail it and then sometimes <laughs> – Sometimes we don't, mate, um, but yeah. that's all right. It's a real life, isn't it, mate? Peace with those days. You win that's it. the others. Are. <laughs> and Elsie, uh, athlete you most admire and why? Um, I think I just named two of them, mm. Joe Pavey and Karen McCann. Karen, um, you know, had such a massive influence on me when I was a junior, um, especially when I was struggling with anorexia. Like she – could sense it I was still you know not open about it not talking about it with anyone and but she could obviously see it and she was just so nurturing and you know non-judgmental and just um just took me under her wing you know we she took me picked me up and took me out to we got measured for our you know first Olympic uniform together Right. Um, and I've, I didn't end up making that Olympics in Sydney because I got a stress fracture yeah. um, before it. But, you know, she, she picked me up and took me out to that day and um, then drove me to my first training camp at Falls Creek and I stayed with her and she just had a baby and was still breastfeeding. And I'm like, wow, you know, like she's, she's breastfeeding a baby and she's training, um, you know, for the world championships at the same time. It was, you know, like I was just in awe. And, you know, and then, you know, all of a sudden, a few years later, I'm going through really um, obviously similar stages in my life with having a baby. And I just, you know, I was just I'm, – I'm really grateful for, for um, you know, the impact that she had on my life and, you know, miss her a lot. I think about her a lot when I'm running and I go around to different races, especially races that, you know, I got to room with her at or – you know, Melbourne half marathon, um, we finished in the MCG and, yeah. you know, the night before, a couple of weeks ago, I watched the YouTube of her coming into the MCG at the Commonwealth Games and, you know, like she, she just, she inspired a nation yeah. and not just because of her running, it was because of, you know, the sort of person that she was and I got to see that. I had the pleasure of seeing that and, yeah, she was amazing and then, the other one's Joe Pavey, just, yeah, having two children and going to five Olympics, which is incredible in running, like, yeah. because it's such a fickle sport, you know, so up and down. How does anyone get, you know, like in an Olympic year, every, get it right every time? Like, I'm just in awe of that. And she's like, she's got it right. Like, she's performed at every Olympics and, 
you know, done really well and she's still going and she's about to turn, I think she just turned 43 actually. Yeah, so. that's uber inspiring, isn't it? And I, a fellow, you know, uh, guest on the show, uh, Nick Willis. I mean, I was inspired by Nick and then Nick's performance as fifteen hundred meter runner, obviously in Rio. And I love to see this. These, you know, runners uh, just keep keep getting better. It's just yeah. terrific, isn't it? Hey, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely inspiring. Uh, LZ, toughest competitor you've ever raced? Um, oh, that's a hard one. Australian or can, internationally? You, yeah, all time. All time. Um, oh, I can't. Australian. Let's let's narrow the uh, search. Uh, I, I'd, I actually, I would probably say Sonia Sullivan. Okay, so Sonia. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like she, she would compete at training, you know, <laughs> and it was good because we'd all. We'd all like train really hard when you were training with Sonia, even when you went for a, and I rabbit is this an easy run. Um, yeah, it was a hard run if you were running with Sonia because, yeah, she'd always be a couple of steps in front of you and you know, always half wheeling you and making you feel like, yeah, I've got it, <laughs> I'm just hanging on here. <laughs> and, um, uh, sorry, I so yeah. It. Probably, probably Sonia, just because she's just, she was such a competitor, still is such a competitor, Um, you know, in what she's doing now. And yeah, but definitely when she was um, competing professionally, like she was, you know. Ferocious. Yeah, ferocious. Ferocious. And actually, Sonia commented on the 10,000 metre final too in Rio. And so that's a bit of a uncanniness there that, um, you know, she then gave comments to how well you girls performed. So yeah. I thought it was quite nice. Um, Elsie, changing slight tact here. What's on your bucket list life wise and uh, running career wise? Um, bucket list life wise, we want to spend. Um, We'd like to spend like a good stint of time in Uganda over where our um, Love Mercy projects are. Yeah. Um, you know, minimum sort of three months, potentially 12 months. Um, we just don't know when that's going to be. It might be post career, it might be before then. But um, yeah, that's definitely something that we've always wanted to do. I'd like to write, um, you know, and um, document some stories of people that I've met there and their, um, you know, their life stories. And um, my husband's a photographer, so maybe, you know, turning something into that. Um, And then I guess running-wise, yeah, another Olympics, Tokyo, Commonwealth Games, like coming back to World Champs next year, London, yeah, Commonwealth Games and then... Tokyo Olympics and then um yeah we'll see after that I definitely definitely want to finish my career running marathons so um we're just not sure when that will be and I mean I'm, I've been asked to run New York next year oh but I um but tempting as it is yeah I don't yeah tempting as it is uh, I'm not sure that I'm really um I'm not sure I have the desire yet, and I really want to wait until that time because right. I know that you, to do that training and obviously to put everything into it and to make the sacrifices um, financially and also, you know, my family makes a certain amount of sacrifices as well. So just want to make sure everyone's on board with that and then, yeah, we'll see. But I definitely have – I definitely want to do New York because I was born there, so I that that would be – that's a bucket list for sure. So that's you. Yeah, I believe, uh, was it White Hills or is, it, is that the right – where, where you were in New oh, York? White, White Plains. White Plains. White Plains, yeah. Uh, so that's your hometown race in, in brackets. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, what a race. I was actually there last year for the New York Marathon. I was fortunate to get an entry over there and, uh, yeah, I – 
come back and tell every runner that if you can put it on your bucket list for some time in your running life. So uh, yeah, totally fascinated to, to watch you watch you run that one, Elsie. Elsie, um, you mentioned Love Mercy. This is obviously the foundation that you co-founded with uh, Julius, a Ugandan runner, a dual Olympian, and it's obviously something that's very close to your heart. Um, can you give listeners a little bit of context, you know, about what you do and and, and how they can find out more and get involved? Yeah, sure. We um we have three main projects. So we do child sponsorship, and then we've built a medical clinic um, in Julius's community, um, and it's service around services twenty thousand people in the area. And then um, our main focus for the next five years is our microfinance farming loan program that we run with um, primarily with women and um, where we loan a woman a loan of seeds, so 30 kilograms of seeds, um, and she goes and grows and harvests those seeds. And usually 30 kilos of seeds turns into 150 to 300 kilograms of food. And with that food, she's able to sell it at the marketplace um, and use that money to send her kids to school, buy other household items, use it for medical um, things and... um, and also she's, she uses some of the harvest to feed her family. And it's actually empowering families to create their own livelihood and it's breaking the cycle of poverty. And this year we ran it with 7,000 women. And by 2020 we hope to have 20,000 women in the program. And um, what happens is, uh, yeah, we encourage people to sign up to um, or donate to Love Mercy, either a one-off donation of $30 or to sign up to give $30 a month. Um, and at the end of the actual harvest season, the woman actually gives back the 30-kilo loan so that we can pass it on to another woman. So it's not when you give $30 to sponsor a woman, it doesn't just end there. It's actually a flow-on effect of that because um, it's a completely sustainable program. So we're excited about Sense for Seeds. We, um, we're hoping to take it into other um, areas of Africa as well, Tanzania. Um, we're looking at that this year and or next year. And, um, yeah, we're excited that obviously the World Cross Country is going to be in Uganda next year and hopefully bring um, a little bit more exposure to um, you know, the Ugandan culture and um, way of life over there and what they've been through and also, um, you know, exposure to, to the projects that Love Mercy run there too. Yeah, that's amazing. And I mean, I, I gain an insight off the Love Mercy, you know, website, which listeners will drop all this in the show notes so you can check out the Sense for Seeds projects and the other projects. But Elsie, the story of, uh, of how it came to be founded and moved, I believe, yourself and your family, can you just briefly give us an overview of that story how it all started yeah i met julius um you know i had an injury um when i was trying to make the beijing olympics i I had a stress fracture in my foot and you know it was going to be the third olympics that i'd miss and uh i was really discouraged and I, i to be honest it was the only time in my career that i've said I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm quitting this sport because it's so heartbreaking. And, you know, I got asked by Alberto Salazar over to America to try and rehab my foot on the Alter G, um, which was the only one in the world at that time in 2008. And um, Nick had been talking to him and um, working it all out. And, you know, he invited me over and I kind of reluctantly went, um, over to Portland. I was still really discouraged. I kind of didn't know how it was all going to work out in terms of how I was going to, you know, get a stress fracture right in eight weeks and be in Olympic shape. And um, I met Julius in the house that I stayed at in Portland where the Alter G was. And um, yeah, we just had this immediate friendship. I remember um, Julius asking me how my foot was and I was really honest with him. And you know, kind of giving me him a real woe is me story. And he said, you know, if I tell you my story and where I've come from, then your foot problem would become very small. And wow. and he did. He just began to tell me of being born into um, poverty in northern Uganda. And um, at age 11, he was forced to be a child soldier and held at a rebel camp for three months. And 
he escaped from there and finding home. He taught himself how to run and to cut his story really short, he, um, like you said, he was a dual Olympian at the 1500 meters in Athens Olympics in 96 and then 2000 um, in Sydney for the 1500. He made the semifinal and um, and when I met Julius, he was actually carrying, he was he was working as a pacemaker for Nike at the time and um, he was sending most of that wage home to care for 11 orphans that he'd found living underneath the bus in the, in the height of the war. And, um, yeah, I was just really moved by Julius's story and um, he told me about his vision for his village and his community, the surrounding communities, and, you know, the war had finally... Um, died down and you know there'd been no more rebel activity but people were coming back out of the IDP camps and having nothing to start with and you know I didn't end up making the Beijing Olympics but I knew that I was there to meet Julius and a few months later Johnny um, my husband and I and my parents-in-law flew to Uganda and we went to Julius's wedding to his wife Grace and um, yeah we just saw the devastation that the war had left and we met all of the kids um that he'd been caring for and the number had grown to um 18 by that stage and um yeah we thought that we should start something um in australia so that uh, we can raise money and um start some projects to help people back on their feet and that was that's probably the the been the goal from the beginning is that that idea of actually just standing beside people um, rather than enabling them to become dependent on us. Um, You know, more so our goal is always just to be, to empower people to create their their own livelihood and, um, and help them stand on their own two feet rather than us kind of carrying them and giving them handouts all the time. So that's the whole idea behind Sense for Seeds. Um, is that they actually do all the work themselves. We're just giving them a loan and they're like entrepreneurs, you know, starting their own business, their own farming business. And uh, they get educated as well as part of the program. Beautiful. And, um, and workshops and, yeah, and how to save and learn how to save. And, yep. and has Love Mercy given you a new level of significance with what you do and the platform you have? Yeah, absolutely. I think... You know, like I've, I feel like um, running has found a purpose above and beyond, um, you know, my own sort of ambition and um, my own goals. Mm. Yeah, I do feel like I have a responsibility to the people that um, we've met over there to, um, you know, continue to run and raise awareness for. Um, that you know the plight that they've been through and um, yeah and the vision their vision for the future as well and standing alongside them in that yeah that's fantastic and it's certainly a perspective isn't it you know um, Elsie two final questions um, one you mentioned is this technology that as a physiotherapist I've been fascinated with and that's the alter G um, yeah can you give listeners a little bit of an understanding as to why you used it and what it was for as a practice we actually just thought it was like we're all in as physiotherapists or not at all and we thought it'd be <laughs> worthwhile to, to pop one in the practice and uh, runners have been you know experiencing some great help with that what, what is it and how did it help you with that campaign um well it's a so it's a, a treadmill it was actually originally built for nasa to give um astronauts going to space the feeling of um weightlessness and then they obviously realized that it would be really helpful for athletes, it would be really helpful for recovering spinal injury patients, um, you know, post-surgery and um, that sort of thing. So, yeah, they started using it um, for that as well. And, I mean, um, we purchased one for our personal training studio about six years ago. Um and yeah, I mean, I get on it every now and then if I need to, if I want to do, I guess, extra miles or if I am feeling tired or sometimes if I'm carrying a niggle, um, just to take the load off. Um, yeah, and it does enable you to, um, to run slightly lighter and obviously then, of course, the impact is less on your body. Yeah, um, Yeah, 
it's just it's in a controlled environment as well i think that that's a really important thing yeah and if you're interested listeners i'll put a little we'll put a link in the show notes and click through and have a bit of a read a bit more of a read about this technology it's it's uh, it's fascinating elsie your last question what's one bit of advice you'd give to people looking to perform at their physical best um one piece of advice i think i just think stay consistent like consistency is the key um, in terms of training, um, not, there's not one session that's going to make you fit. <laughs> um, it's like 45 sessions, um, all blocked together. Um, that's gonna, you know, get you in good shape. So, um, I think don't rush if you're coming back from an injury or, um, a, you know, a layoff, then don't rush back. I think one of the biggest things that I learned when I was um, getting injured a lot is that, um, you know, I'd, I'd have a race plan before I was fully fit again. And I think it's important probably to do it the other way around um, is to actually just get in shape first and focus on getting, you know, reasonably fit, getting my base up, getting the foundational fitness back and then focusing on a race rather than trying to have that, I guess, that pressure of a goal there. Um, yeah, I think just stay consistent. It's such a common theme and uh, something so simple but easy to lose sight of, isn't it? That they're all building blocks. And uh, LZ, we like to, you know, I like to issue, have the guests issue a physical challenge for listeners for the week. It can be anything extremely hard or, you know, very just first step, you know, oriented. What would be LZ Wellens as? physical challenge for the week and listeners if you take on the challenge let us know uh over on uh elsie's social media handles and you can drop me in it at brad underscore beer but what would it be elsie um we we were doing chin-ups yesterday after training actually and so yeah my goal is to get to 10 chin-ups um in a row but you know yours might be five (laughs) Because you know, so hard. Yep, yep, but, to, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, got it. So, so we'll, we'll go for five, hey, Elsie? Make it yeah, moderate. Yeah, let's go it. for five. All yeah. right, guys. So, if you can. Well, I can only do three at the moment. That was after a hard track session. So, maybe I could push out one more if I was fresh. All right. So, inside this seven days when this show goes live, Elsie, we've, you've got seven days to hit the five, right? Yeah. Cool. Yep. And where can Done. listeners uh, find you on social, Elsie? Um, LZ Wellings um, is my Instagram um, and then I'm on Facebook as well and LZ Wellings on Twitter too. Yeah, fantastic. And obviously, listeners, uh, jump over, check out Love Mercy Foundation as well, the show notes um, over at Pogo Physio. And LZ, um, as a running a runner myself and running fan uh, and just admirer of people that have longevity in any physical pursuit uh, i just want to say well done it's uh, i've been looking forward to catching up with you for some time and thanks for generously sharing today um, thanks brad and absolutely wish you all the best for the exciting uh, projects ahead of you and, and the years ahead of pbs thank you how about that eloise wellings what an inspirational character inspirational athlete an inspirational human being I, like you, I'm sure, have been moved by Eloise's uh, genuineness and her compassion to help others, such as through the Love Mercy Foundation. So much so that I'd like to extend listeners of the Physical Performance Show a challenge, and that is to jump over to Love Mercy Foundation's homepage and click on the Sense for Seeds campaign. You'll see it there on the homepage. And for every listener that donates a packet of seeds to the ladies of Uganda through the program, as Eloise outlined, the physical performance show will match it. Now, we're setting a goal or a target that 10 people will jump on over and donate. If it goes beyond 10, we'll honour our commitment. What we'll need to do, though, is have this happen inside the next seven days from this show going live. Listeners, if you're taking up the Sense for Seeds challenge over the seven days of this podcast going live, uh, please, in the text box, uh, as you purchase the Sense for Seeds donation, list uh, Brad Beer Physio as the uh, little code there that will trigger Eloise and the team uh, at 
Love Mercy Foundation to be able to track the donations made by the podcast listeners so that uh, we can come through the physical performance show, Pogo Physio, and match every donation made in that seven days by listeners. So let's really get behind this Love Mercy Foundation, Sense for Seeds Great Initiative, and let's see what we can do inside the seven days of this podcast episode going live. Guys, uh, thanks so much for those that have been rating and reviewing the show. Uh, it's, it means a lot, and it's really heartening to see um, some great reviews coming through, such as this one from Incredible Journeys by Give Me Sugar One. Give Me Sugar said, absolutely loving this podcast. What an inspiration to listen to these incredible journeys and obstacles they have overcome to become their very best. So motivating. Thanks so much uh, for the five stars there, Give Me Sugar. And uh, guys, if you would like to review, jump over iTunes, ratings and review, and leave your review. That'd be fantastic. It helps the show become more visible for other pick performers who just like yourself are seeking their best. Coming up on episode 33 of the Physical Performance Show, I catch up with an incredible athlete who has just returned from the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon where she won the 55 to 59 age division. This is Jenny Alcorn. Jenny Hale is from the Gold Coast and Jenny has been coaching and involved in the sport of the triathlon for, for 30 to 40 years. She's an incredible athlete. Uh, I have known Jenny for at least 25 years and this year she achieved, achieved a bucket list uh, achievement in winning Kona, the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon. You're going to really love this insight into what it takes to perform at your physical best and keep the passion and flame alive as we pass through our life. And no better person to talk to us about that than the incredible Jenny Alcorn. So stay tuned. In the meantime, keep pursuing your physical best. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.